Mainline. Metro, light rail, trams. They sound like simple labels, but in UK law, they mean very different things. And those definitions shape everything from axle loads to fire safety. The Railways and Other Guided Transport System Regulations, ROGs, split the UK rail systems into categories that set the standards and requirements for operations and safety. That's why the Underground, the DLR and the Tyne and Weir Metro don't always sit where you'd expect. So let's break down how the regulator draws the lines and what those categories really mean for engineers. Transport systems that run on rails are classed as guided transport systems. As the name suggests, the vehicles are guided by fixed rails, unlike cars or buses which can steer freely. In the UK, these systems are governed by the Railways and Other Guided Transport Systems regulations, better known as ROGs. And this is where the differences begin. ROGs makes a clear distinction between the mainline railway and other guided transport systems. That distinction sets the legal requirements and expectations for each type, and it defines how the industry regulator, the Office of Road and Rail, or ORR, oversees them. On one side, you have the mainline railway, the national network. On the other, everything else. Underground railways, light rail, tramways, and heritage railway. It's this split laid out in regulations that provides the framework for how UK railways are categorised. Under ROGS, the mainline railway is defined as the national rail network. It's what most people picture when you say railways, the system carrying intercity trains, commuter services and freight. The main line runs on its own right of way and is generally fully segregated, though interfaces such as level crossings do exist. Power and control systems vary by route. From 25,000 volt overhead line, to third rail, to diesel trains, alongside different signalling regimes. Because of its scale and complexity, the main line also carries the most stringent requirements under ROPS. Operators and infrastructure managers must have a Documented Safety Management System, or SMS, which sets out how risks are identified and controlled. Safety certificates and authorizations are required to run on the main line. Non-mainline operators don't usually need these unless they access the national network. Competence management systems needed for staff to ensure training and skills are maintained and there in the first place, and they're required to make regular safety reports to the regulator. From an engineering perspective, it's built to the most prescriptive standards because it has to accommodate the heaviest loads and the fastest services in the country. Axle loads are higher, so the track formation is deeper, more robust. Curves are broader, gradients shallower, and signalling is designed to support both high speed and dense timetables. It's also intermodal. Passenger and freight services share the same traps, with rolling stock ranging from electric commuter units to diesel and biomo trains, right through to heavy freight locomotives. When we move beyond the mainline UK railway network into more localised transport systems, ROGS places most of them in the category of light rail and tramways. The ORR is still the safety regulator for these areas. Light rail generally uses electrical power, rail guided vehicles on exclusive or semi-exclusive alignments. Tramways are a specific type of light rail with a significant street running element in highway or public space, though many systems run in mixed environments. Light rail systems like the Docklands Light Railway and the Tyne and Weir Metro are usually segregated. The vehicles are lighter, axle loads are lower, and because the vehicles themselves are shorter, the platforms are shorter too. These systems are developed to provide the benefits of rapid transit at lower cost than building a full metro system or extending the mainline railway. Tramways, by contrast, are often run directly on the street. They share space with cars, cyclists and pedestrians, using grooved rails embedded within the road surface. They can take extremely tight curves, sometimes down to as little as 25 metres in radius, and stop much more frequently than other systems. And then there's the Tyne Weir Metro. By name, most people would expect it to sit within metro systems, but in the ORR's classification, it sits firmly here, under light rail and tramways. ORR's list of regulator systems makes that clear. Even though ROGS groups light rail and tramways together, they look and behave differently. Segregated light rail faces the challenges of lighter infrastructure and smaller vehicles, while tramways must manage the added complexity of mixing with road traffic and pedestrians. Some systems, don't sit comfortably in the categories we've covered so far. They're not part of the national main line, but they don't fit neatly into light railway or tramways either. That's why the ORR makes a separate distinction for underground railways. The ORR defines an underground system as an electric public transport network that runs both above and below ground. In the UK, that means two examples, 
the London Underground and the Glasgow Subway. Both are fully segregated systems with their own power and control systems. Their infrastructure is similar in principle to the main line, but adapted for dense urban operation, with smaller tunnels and trains, sharper curves and gradients, and different traction power systems. The risks they face are also different. Because they operate in tunnels and closed environments, the ORR places particular focus on fire safety and ventilation, emergency access and evacuation, and managing passenger flow in busy stations. Internationally, these kind of systems are usually called metros. It isn't the statutory wording in ROTS, but the ORR itself that refers to underground railways and metros, including London Underground, in its guidance document. So even though ROGS and the ORR define these categories clearly, main line, light railway and tramways, and underground railways, the everyday names don't always match up. That's why systems like the Tyne and Weir Metro or Docklands Light Railway are often confused. But the classifications do matter. That's what sets the standards for infrastructure, for safety management, and how the ORR regulates each system. Here's some practical ways to spot the difference. Right of way. The main line and metros, fully segregated. For light rail, semi-segregated. For tramways, it's street running, shared environment. When it comes to vehicles and loads, the main line has heavier, longer trains with highest axle loads. And trams have the lightest trainable with tight curve capability. When it comes to op for operation, the main line railway has a wide speed range, but also dense headways. Light rail and the underground are urban rapid transit with lower infrastructure costs. And for trams, their frequent stopping and high accessibility in dense urban centres. Looking through the regulatory lens and ROGS and the way the ORR undertake their work, mainline versus non-mainline sets the certification and reporting requirements. The ORR has chosen to separately address underground railways and regulates also the whole of the light rail and tramway sector. For passengers, the difference may blur together. But for engineers and operators, these categories are fundamental. They determine everything from track form and axle loads to the risks that have to be managed day to day. And while the systems differ, one principle cuts across all of them. Cant, the way the track is tilted to balance train forces on curves. So if you want a better grasp on Cant and track design, download my Guide to Cant ebook for free and level up your knowledge.